Okay, so there's a lot of Italy, and we're gonna be focusing mostly just on Venice, Florence, and Rome. And, and uh, boy, you could, you could just have a wonderful nine or 10 days in that. And, and with our itinerary, we fly into Venice and we fly out of Rome. There's no financial advantage of flying in and out of the same city. If your time's worth anything, you wanna fly open jaws into one side and out of the other. You're not gonna fly straight from Seattle to Rome. You're gonna change in London anyways. You might as well change in London and go to Venice and then fly from London or from Rome back to London and return to Seattle or something like that. We've had so much fun filming our TV shows over the years, and we also have the uh, DVD in our tour promotional package that'll help you better understand our program, and we've got an incredible crew of guides that are gonna help make your Italian experience right. Just last year, I was doing my TV work in Rome, and I stumbled into this happy group of people, and when I see a group of travelers with that many smiles, I have a hunch it's one of our groups, okay? <laughs> And sure enough, it was. And uh, I just love to bump into my tour groups while they're in, in Europe, and uh, I forget who the guide was. But I, don't, I just, when I'm running around Europe doing my work, invariably I'm bumping into guide our, our tours and seeing what a wonderful job our guides do. Uh, we also have, while we have great guides that do the whole story, we also have guides in each city that oftentimes we will employ just to get a local expert's uh, uh, passion for Rome or Assisi or whatever. This is Francesca. She flew all the way from Rome to be with us today. I was just with her at our party, and Francesca is our Roman guide. So if you're doing Venice, Florence, Rome, you're going to have some time with Francesca in Rome because that's where she is really specializing. Also, we've done a lot of work with uh, audio guides and apps and uh, guidebooks and maps, and there's plenty of ways you can get information. Our guidebook, Europe 101, is half of it's on Italy because there's so much of Europe's history and art comes out of Italy. Okay. Now I'm going to take you through a look at what I think is the most exciting 10 days for urban Italy. Of course, you got the Riviera, you got Hilltowns, you got the South, you got the Dolomite, you got the lakes, but if you just want urban Italy and you got 10 days, Venice, Florence, Rome. You fly into Venice, it's a three hour train ride or bus ride to Florence and a three hour bus ride to Rome, and then you fly home from Rome. If you uh, want more time and you stay longer, Rome is a great place for a few more days, especially when you remember that Naples is just two hours to the south, and an hour beyond that is Sorrento and the Amalfi Coast and so on. Flying into Venice is just one of the great experiences in Europe. It is the best preserved big city you can imagine. And it's important to remember that Venice started you know, way back in the Dark Ages, after the fall of, the fall of Rome, without the, the stability of Rome, you had all sorts of barbarians running all over the place, and there were the bullies, and there were the meek people. And the meek people were the farmers on the mainland by Venice, constantly being trampled by the barbarians, their places burned down, and so on. Finally, they said, enough of this. Let's abandon our farms. We'll move out into the lagoon and hope the barbarians don't like water. So Venice was founded by these people, refugees from the chaos of the Dark Ages, deforesting that part of Italy and pounding in all those uh, tree trunks to make a foundation for their humble little homes in, in the mud flats of the Delta there. And uh, eventually they gave up their farming. They became great fishermen and ultimately great traders. And by the year 1000, it was the economic superpower and military superpower of Europe, with the trading empire stretching all the way to nearly the Holy Land. Uh, it's an amazing story, and when you go to Venice, Thank goodness the island of Venice is perfectly preserved. Now, I love stumbling into our groups on the first night, and a lot of times I'll pop in on the groups. On the first night, you meet your guide. This happens to be Alfio on the first night of his group in Italy, and invariably he's teaching you a little bit of the language, you're singing a few songs, you're learning the, getting the groundwork of how you're gonna run a tour efficiently. And then you, you set out to see these towns. We have a system of orient and disperse. We do what makes sense to do with the guide. We learn how to use the public transportation. In the case of Venice, it would be boats. And then we are on our own. Uh, remember when you're in Italy that uh, it's nice to have a little bit of free time and to know how to get out and about and, and leave the crowds. Uh, you're going to see the arsenal. Uh, the arsenal was a, a place where the Italians, the Venetians could really show off. If somebody was going to threaten Italy or threaten Venice, back when Venice was a very powerful city-state, all they would do is take that potential adversary to the arsenal, and they were able to put together a whole warship ship in about two days, and then equip it in another day, and then it would sail out into the harbor, and those potential adversaries would think, 
Let's not mess with Venice, all right? Arsenal at Venice is quite exciting to check out. Venice is beautifully preserved, and uh, this is a couple hundred years ago, but it looks much like that today. It's just more up to date with the clothing. You've still got the Campanile. You can go up there for a great view of the city, and from the top you look out and you see there's no modern buildings in the whole city, and no cars. This is the main boulevard, the Grand Canal, and you get around with city buses. In the case of Venice, they are Vaporettos. They work like buses. You got numbered buses, you got stops with names. It's just the only difference is if you get off between stops, you can drown, okay? So uh, be careful about that. Uh, I love getting the boat, getting the hang of that boat system and then going all to the far reaches of the system. Anytime you've got a guide to help you sort it out, this is just such a, a beautiful thing when you're overwhelmed by a new city. We want to get you organized as soon as possible. You've got lots of resources. Uh, uh, also, be sure to take advantage of the uh, Rick Steves Audio Europe app. It's free. It covers all the tours and lots of interviews from our guides that I've done in the radio show over the years. Venice is crowded with everybody who packs in each day, but it's like rush hour. In the morning they come in, you can see it in the Vaporetti, and at night they all head out. It's uh, heavy traffic coming in, heavy traffic going out. We like to get up early, stay out late. We pay extra to keep our groups right downtown, so you're in the action. You hear the bells ringing early in the morning, and your memories are not just all the tourist clutter, and you're not one of these tourists that lie in the Rialto Bridge during the middle of the day. You're there all alone after hours or before hours, and then you get that magic. You understand that this Doge's palace was the most important political and economic center in Europe in its day, and you tour it with a wonderful guide. You understand the importance of Venice being an economic power with no relics. They had to send out somebody to get some decent relics, and they sent them out to Egypt, and they picked up the bones of St. Mark. Apparently there were little newsletters going around, and they could figure out where we can get some relics, and they sent them down to, Saint, uh, to Egypt, and they rescued the bones of St. Mark, Brought him back to Venice, St. Theodore and the Dragon was out, they planted Mark's bones under the cathedral, and St. Mark and the Winged Lion was in, and you've got yourself a very important stop on the pilgrimage trail. There's St. Theodore and the Dragon, the earlier patron saint, and then we got Mark and the Winged Lion. This is the front door of Venice, right here where the boats would stop, and that tumbles right into Piazza San Marco, right here, and you see the Doge's Palace connected to the, uh, the Doge's Palace connected to the St. Mark's Basilica. Here we have the political leader, here we have the religious power, and here we have the great square in Venice. If you look at the tap at the mosaic uh, on the door above the entry to the church, you see that day when here, in an artist's sort of idea, you. we've got uh, St. Mark after the long bumpy voyage from Egypt, looking a little bit grumpy, being brought in by the town fathers to be planted in the basilica there. And when you step into the basilica, you can kind of see, imagine a a thousand years ago, what a glorious, dazzling place that must have been. With the help of your guide, you'll understand that history. And you've got uh, the, the St. Mark's Basilica uh, filled with plunder of the Venetian Empire. I call this kind of architecture early ransack, okay? You've got, you've got famous columns and capitals and horses from all over uh, the, the Venetian world. Uh, we do the cliches. I mean, if you go to Venice, you gotta do glass blowing, you know? And uh, we do it with a meaningful way, but we don't do it tied in with kickbacks and options. You'll see the sales pitch but your guide is on your side and we arrange it so if we do shopping as a group you get the net price rather than us taking you shopping and then coming back later to get 20% of whatever went into the till. I like art in situ. That means art where the artist painted it. And your guides are enthusiastic about that. And when you're in Venice, the Chiesa di Fiari is a beautiful place, the Church of the Brothers, the Chiesa di Fiari, because you've got art by the great masters of the Venetian Renaissance right there where they were designed. This is by a Titian, Titian the Venetian. <laughs> uh, another must-do thing in Venice is a gondola ride, and uh, with the help of your guides, you know, it's kind of a racket. You pay 90 bucks for 40 minutes in a gondola. You can divide the romance and the price by up to six people, okay? <laughs> so with our guides, we'll organize it with six of you, and it's 15 bucks each if you'd like to do it. And that's something where it's above and beyond the call of, uh, of the tour, but it's something that you'll probably want to do, and your guide will make sure that you get to do it well. I love the gondola ride when I'm in Venice. 
This is, by the way, a shot I took in the dead of winter. And it's just really fun to be in Italy in the winter. It's a little cold, but there's none of the crowds. And there's a special sort of magic to Venice, Florence, and Rome in the winter. If you want an affordable gondola, you just take a traghetto. That's one of the gondolas that go across the Grand Canal where there's no bridge. There's only four bridges across the Grand Canal, and there's a long canal. So where there's no bridge and there's a need, you'll have traghettos for just a couple bucks can take you across. But the best way to do Venice is to walk. A lot of people get worried about getting lost in Venice. Don't be worried about getting lost in Venice. Get as lost as you can and keep reminding yourself, I'm on an island and I can't get off. <laughs> and when you, when you find yourself around, when you want to find your way, you just look above the crowds and you will see signs pointing to the nearest landmark. And it's very, I mean, here you can see San Marco, either way. <laughs> I remember when I was a student taking groups around Venice, I would just wander and wander and wander with my little groups and they'd go, how does he know where he is? And I didn't know where I was, but when I wanted to find my way, I would just look above the crowds and you'd see a sign pointing you back to this or that famous square. But what you want to do is wander to the far reaches where you get this wonderful pastel, peaceful world. And it's amazing to me how 90% of the tourists in Venice are right there in that, in that sort of shopping trance between Rialto and St. Mark's, just walking back and forth all day long. You need to recognize that we are little creatures that are attracted to dangly, shiny things, okay? And uh, you gotta break away from that and not be such a shopper and take advantage of the opportunity to lose yourself in the wonder of Venice. I used to say, immerse yourself in Venice, but that's not a good word to use <laughs> in that particular city. Uh, but you get this kind of beautiful sights if you know where to look. I like to go into the lagoon and imagine what it was like way, way back when, when I told you those uh, refugees were coming in from the mainland, and much of the lagoon today looks like it did. In fact, this is the very earliest settlement, Torcello, and it was decimated by malaria, therefore depopulated and covered up by the, by the centuries, but we have the oldest church in Venice here, and I'm taking this photograph from its campanile, from its bell tower, and here you see the kind of lagoon area where Venice was originally settled. We like to feed our groups well, and I can promise you our guides are enthusiastic eaters, and they know how to get you in touch with the local food in the right season. You want local food, you want it served Casalinga style, home cooking, and you want it seasonal. Your guides know how to do that, and we will sit down and have family style meals, so you're going to get a good dose of the culture. Alda goes, Yes, yes, yes. I just can't get enough of that, yeah. And uh, so we'll have some good, good eating in, in Italy. And what you're in, in uh, Venice, uh, Cicchetti is the local tapas. And you want to go to the little bars and eat just a lot of ugly things on toothpicks and then wash it down with local wine. It's, it doesn't cost much. Great experience. All the wonderful little seafood delicacies. And you're hanging out with local Venetians. At night, I love to be... In, on the island so that we can wander around and be on our own. And your guide may not have it as part of the formal tour, but your guide will organize adventures in the after hour, after dinner hours where you can go wandering around and enjoy the, uh, the concerts with the dueling orchestras on the main square and so on. I show this photograph here to remind you that the reality of tour is you're relocating every couple of nights. On this particular tour, we're three nights in a row for three stops, so it's not that big a deal. But still, you have to load everything up and walk to the bus. In the case of Venice, of course, the bus doesn't go into the old island. We don't want to keep people on the mainland like normal tours. Normal tours keep you on the mainland for lots of good reasons. They keep you on the mainland because hotels cost half that they do on the island. They keep you on the mainland because they're modern, cookie-cutter, comfortable hotels where everybody's got reliable elevators and air conditioning and so on. And we have more funky, characteristic hotels in the old island. They're 400 years old. And they keep you on the mainland because then there's no way to get back onto the island without paying $60 for the optional sightseeing tour. We keep you right downtown, spending more than we need to on the hotel, so you can step out your door and enjoy the wonder of Venice, even if you have half an hour before dinner. Do you follow me? There's a lot of good reasons to be downtown, but they make no sense for the typical tour company that is desperate to find a way to make some money off of the impossible price that suckered you in in the beginning because it was nonprofit. See, that's the problem with the tourist industry. They've worked themselves into a bind where they're so cheap, they're false prices, and they make their money off of you uh, over the course of your vacation. When you take a Rick Steves tour, we've made our money up front. We're on your side all the way through, and I'm very proud and, about that and determined about that. You need to be, I guess, long story, to, long way, winded way to get to the point that you've got to be mobile with your luggage because we're going to stay right downtown and you've got to walk quite a long way. We'll take the boat and maybe hire a taxi or something like that. But in, still, 
there's a lot of walking. So we have, here's, uh, this is one of our guides, uh, Lisa, who was my guide when I took her tour of Village Italy. And she's a well-organized traveler here as a tour guide. She's got her 9 by 22 by 14 inch carry in the airplane size roller bag with her day bag that you just put this under the bus and you take this upstairs with you. These women are packing the same way. Uh, this man's packing like I do with the bag this size hanging on his back with padded shoulder straps and his day bag. Here's my son Andy, and he doesn't even bother to use the shoulder straps. He's just got his big bag that way. The point is, you got 25 people marching out of the hotel to get to the bus, and you need to be mobile. I've been going back to these hotels now for 1980 was my first book, so literally, you know, 30 years and developing beautiful relationships with these people. This guy's name's Gino, and his mom used to run the hotel. Now she's retired, and he does. And every year I go back and I have a, a I pose with a photograph with my friend holding the latest book with last year's photograph holding that year's book, and it just goes back and back and back. Our hoteliers are friends of ours. They know our groups. They work with us, and they know our style. We have beautiful hotels. We have characteristic hotels. A lot of them are simple but they are really, in this case, Venetian. When I'm in Venice, I want to take my shoes off and have my toes feel that cool pavimento, Ven what is it? Uh, terrazzo Veneziano. And uh, Virginia, explain what terrazzo Veneziano is. Terrazzo means terrace, and uh. Veneziano is the adjective for Venetian. So terrazzo Veneziano. So the, the pavement of the hotel floor is actually this beautiful material, and it's quite expensive to maintain, it's quite historic, to me, it's evocative of old Venice, and it's designed to flex as the foundations settle with the muddy found, uh, subsoil, and you've got that in the old buildings of Venice. If this hotel is not good enough for you, then you need to go to a different tour. You know, that's kind of what I'm saying. Our hotels are just fine for me. There are uh, a lot of tourist companies would, would think they need something fancier, but we are pretty, uh, pretty committed to our, quote, characteristic local style mom and pop hotels located right downtown. We will never compromise your safety, cleanliness, or a good night's sleep. But you're not gonna get swimming pools and fancy restaurants and all sorts of people in uniforms to carry your bags. We're going to Europe through the back door and that sort of distinguishes us from other tours. A beautiful thing about that is it scares away the people who are the most high maintenance travelers. <laughs> You know what I mean? That's more important than any elevator, I can promise you that. <laughs> okay, so we go from Venice down to Florence, and when you look at Florence, oh man, it is so exciting to think this was the epicenter of that cultural explosion called the Renaissance. And within a 15-minute walk of that great dome, the Dome of Brunelleschi, Duomo is the Italian word for cathedral. The, at the Duomo in Florence, the Brunelleschi Dome. That was the dome that kicked off the architectural renaissance. Within a 15 minute walk of that, you've got most of the ar artistic masterpieces of the renaissance. We can climb to the top of that dome, you can go to the top of the uh, uh, Campanile, you can check out the old baptistry. Remember the pride of Florentines and their city. When Michelangelo, who was a Florentine for sure, had to go down to the Vatican and do something for the Pope, he had to build that St. Peter's Basilica, you know, uh, he said, I can build a dome bigger but not more beautiful than the dome in my hometown of Florence by Brunelleschi. You're gonna learn about that in the pride of the Florentines while you're there. From the top of that dome, you can look out over Florence and see the Medici Palace and the Uffizi Gallery. And uh, remember, in the United States, we've got this concept of the other side of the tracks, you know, the wrong, he comes from the wrong side of the tracks. Well, in Europe, it occurs to me, the wrong side of the tracks is really the wrong side of the river. Think of it, in Rome, you got Trastevere. In Florence, you've got Ultra Arno. In Sevilla, in Spain, you got Triano. It's just the other side of the river, and we like to go to the other side of the river for our cultural scavenger hunts, for our characteristic little restaurants and osterias and so on. So you walk across the bridge into the funky Ultra Arno, and there you get the rough edge of Florence. If you are overwhelmed by how big a city is, remember, we're looking at the medieval city. And on the map, you can see a circular road and that circular road used to be a circular wall. But in modern age, you've got congested cities, they sprawl really big, you need some more space, what do you do? Obviously, tear down the wall, you got yourself a circular boulevard. So on the map today, you can see the circular boulevard, which outlines the most important part of Florence from your sightseeing point of view. Don't worry about everything beyond that circular boulevard, and suddenly Florence is manageable. 
you got beautiful art in Florence and you need to bone up on the Renaissance if you want to get the most out of your experience there, for sure. Remember, in the Renaissance, 600 years ago, around the year 1400, they finally merged art and science so they could show believable three-dimensionality on a 2D surface using mathematics to let that art be real. Up until that time, art was just propaganda and it was just stick figures. It just needed to be representative of this or that. They didn't care about realism. Now with the Renaissance, it had to be realistic and we get that in Florence. In Florence, there's a lot of great medieval art and the beautiful thing is you can see the medieval art and then contrast it with the Renaissance art. And uh, here we got, for instance, a Michelangelo Pieta. There's a lot of uh, beautiful Michelangelo if you know where to look. Your guides know where you can find the good art. Of course, this is the Medici Palace, and the original David went right here. This is a copy now. And the Italian word for offices is uffizi. And Uffizi today is the best collection of Italian paintings anywhere. And if you just go there as a regular tourist, you're going to wait in a long line. And uh, it's very frustrating. But we've already made your reservations. And you're going to walk right by all those people following your guide in, who's a licensed local guide. And then you'll be able to see that in first class sort of style with an expert without waiting in line anywhere. Italy is particularly fraught with lines. When you take our tours, you will not wait in lines. That's a very important aspect of the tours. And then you can enjoy the Botticelli with a local expert without being all exhausted and rushed. Beautiful churches, beautiful art in situ, or you can go shopping. <laughs> We try to make sure you don't get sidetracked with shopping at the expense of seeing, actually seeing Michelangelo's David. It's fun to comparison shop for the goofy little plaster models, but I think you should see the original. And there you go. This is David. This is sort of a, to me, the, the ac academia is like a, a, a church for humanism. And at the center of it is this beautiful body, Michelangelo's David. And when we look at David, we're looking at Renaissance man stepping out of medieval darkness. Remember, when you look at David, that hand is bigger than it should be and it's more developed. And when we think about David, with his, David wasn't gonna slay the giant. David, this is the hand of God. With his faith and with God's guidance, the shepherd boy can over, overcome the giant in, in evil. Just like Florence could overcome its crude neighboring city-states, Pisa, Genoa, and so on. And now when you look into the eyes of David, you're looking into the eyes of Renaissance man stepping out of medieval darkness, sizing up the darkness and thinking like David, I can take this guy, okay? Now when you understand the headiness of the Renaissance and it's right there in Florence, and then you go see Michelangelo's David, wow, that's a cool experience. And that evening you can have a nice gelato and go down to the river and let all of that soak in. I love Florence late at night because none of the crowds are out. And the city government actually lets quality musicians have a certain spot all to themselves. And the, it's like little concerts dotting the town for people who want to get out after dinner. Italians are really into good eating, and it's got to be seasonal, it's got to be local. They're into this slow food notion. I mean, we call it slow food and it's no organization, but over there, I think it's just their sensibility. It just makes sense to know the farm where, the, where your cheese came from and to uh, eat with the season instead of having frozen things that shouldn't be eaten right now at all. I can't, uh, I just... I, I just, that's my, in Italy, it's my favorite thing. Of anywhere in Europe, really, I gotta say, eating in Italy. I spend a lot of time researching my guidebooks. I spend every evening looking at restaurants, and at the end of my re restaurant research night, it's 10 o'clock, restaurants are just locking up. I go into my favorite restaurant of the whole evening, and then I just ask the, the, the chef, bring me whatever you want me to eat. And it's just glorious. You will have that kind of food magic while you're in Italy with your guides. Look at that beautiful Chianina steak. Oh, baby. <laughs> He's one happy Italian here. He's got his steak. There's only one way to cook a steak in Italy. Seven minutes on this side, seven minutes on that side. And then you get it. You can say medium rare. You can say, well, you're going to get it seven plus seven. You'll get it in about 15 minutes after you order it. Bistecca alla Fiorentina. <laughs> yes, yes, and uh, gelato also is where you're going to cap your meal. So lots of fun with the gelato. Okay, from Florence, we're going to head on down to Rome. Three more hours. Beautiful thing about this tour, 10 days, you've only got six hours in transit, and you get to Rome, and here we have a really... A, in a lot of ways, Rome is overwhelming, and we get you situated. You're in one great neighborhood, three nights, two days of organized sightseeing, great guiding, uh, uh, permissions in advance so you don't need to wait in lines and a guide who can help you understand 
the many dimensions of Rome. Of course, with the seven hills of Rome, you've got that common ground between the seven hills. That was the Roman Forum, and that was where the spark of Rome ignited. And if you put it in easy terms, and our guides like to do this, you can say, okay, the story of Rome, rise and fall of Rome, it's a thousand years, from 500 BC to 500 AD. It grows for 500 years, it peaks for 200 years, it falls for 300 years. The first half was the Republic, a little bit idealistic with rich people running a kind of representative government. And the last half was the known, it got so big by the time of Christ, uh, it had to be ruled by an iron-fisted dictatorship and it became the empire, all right? Of course, that's very simplistic, but that gives you sort of a basis and then we'll get more deeply into it. But remember, Rome started right there and it grew to the point where the word Rome no longer meant the city, it meant the entire civilized world. Everything was either Roman or barbarian, people who didn't speak Latin or Greek. And when you walk under that triumphal arch and you see all of this propaganda that made the emperor just like God on earth, and the chained barbarians being brought before the victorious Romans, it's quite easy to get caught up in it if you have a good guide to help explain that. And that's what really turns us on as guides is to sit our groups down on broken rubble of ancient Rome and explain that wonderful, exciting story. Our guides are good at that. And for instance, here is the Basilica Maxentius. And, um, uh, and uh, the Basilica Maxentius or the Basilica of Constantine, it has two different names depending on, they're, they're trying to exactly figure out what it was. But basically, you've got yourself a huge ruin here. And I, for years, looked at that and thought that was big. And then I realized, wait a minute, this is just the side niche. I'm standing on what seems like a vacant lot the size of a football field. And I look up here and I see that little nub and it occurs to me, my goodness, that is the beginning of an arch that went all the way across this football field. And then you fill it all in and you decorate it with semi-precious stones and fountains and people with togas. It just is mind blowing. How can we get our brains around the magnificence and the splendor of Rome? That's our challenge when we travel there. I mean, here's the Colosseum, numbered seats, 50,000 seats. They could fill it and empty it as quickly and efficiently as we do our modern stadiums. Now here's a long line of hot, sweaty, bored, frustrated tourists. <laughs> These are not waiting to get into the Colosseum. They're waiting to have a ticket to get into the Colosseum. Your guide knows how to get a ticket, and you're going to walk right by these people without saying anything too smart aleck and walk right in and enjoy that great sight. And with the help of your guide, you're going to be able to put it together and imagine what it was like 2,000 years ago. And then you're going to go to the Pantheon. And here is a building, again, that gives you a feeling of the grandeur of Rome. You're going to step inside, and you're going to notice that this is really Roman kind of engineering. Uh, it's very logical. It's based on a circular plan as exactly as wide as it is tall, 140 feet, with a big, beautiful skylight on the top. Oh, man, and to learn all the little intimate details of that and then why it is so well-preserved. It's so well-preserved in part because it was a temple to all the pagan gods until the Christians took over, and then it became a temple to the martyrs. So it was never had a time when it could just be or a, uh, a church to the martyrs. Uh, it was never uh, cannibalized like so many other great buildings were. You'll see the Pantheon. You'll also notice in Rome, there's almost no buildings, no modern buildings. They're all pre-World War II buildings. There's one modern building I've seen in downtown Rome, and this is the new building that houses the Peace Arch. And when Rome, by the time of Christ, Rome had reached its vast expanse, and the emperor said, okay, We'll call it an empire. Now we'll establish the Roman peace. So they put their big boots on the neck of the downtrodden barbarians, and they said, is everything okay? Ready for stability? Yeah, okay. So now there is Roman stability all over the empire, and they had this big festival, and you can see the Roman peace uh, altar right there, the Arapaches. Michelangelo helped design this beautiful square, the Capitoline Square, on the hill overlooking the Colosseum. And from the top of that square, you can go into two great museums with the help of your guides and be able to put together some of the art. I believe this is Emperor Constantine. And we have going way back to Etruscan times. This is a 500 BC she-wolf, famous for Romulus and Remus, you know, the mythological founders of Rome. Here is a building in modern Rome, just built 120 or 130 years ago, dedicated to Victor Emmanuel, the king of Italy, modern Italy, united in 1870. But when we look at this building, a lot of people think it's a monstrosity because it's so pompous. I like it because it gives us a feeling for the pomposity of ancient Rome. I think if you took 500 of these buildings and scattered them all around in a tight sort of gaggle, you would have 
what ancient Rome must have looked like. Uh, and and it just helps us to in, try to envision ancient Rome. This is the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier here. And it's great now because you can actually go to the very top of this building and then you get a view all around if your guide knows about the elevator. And your guides do know about the elevator and that gets you to the top for the great view. The, probably the most sumptuous, in fact, I have a new favorite word, exquisite. Aldo, what is the word exquisite in Italian? Squisito. Squisito. <laughs> si. And what is very exquisite? This is very nice. Squisitissimo. <laughs> Do you like it? Say that, try it. Squisitissimo. Yeah, let's try. <laughs> it's difficult. Squisitissimo. Well, let's try Squisitissimo. Yeah, so the, uh, the Galleria Borghese is squisitissimo. Uh, you need a reservation long in advance, and you go in there with a guide, and you've got a chance to see the squisitissimo Bernini statues. This is, Bernini was the father of the Baroque movement, and his greatest art is right here. Every room features an amazing Bernini statue. If you know where to look in Rome, you can find so much great art. Here is Michelangelo's Moses. In a relatively obscure church, the Church of St. Peter's in Chains, just a 10 minute walk above the Roman Colosseum. When you go to the Colosseum, it's nice to know you've got Michelangelo's statue right there. This is Francesca, and she's, as I mentioned, she's visiting us today, and she's one of our local guides that we will work with while we're in Rome. I always find it's interesting how Italians don't go to church a lot, unless they almost lose their life in a motorcycle accident, and then they'll, they'll go to church and they'll hang their, their helmet up here, won't they? Huh? Is that interesting or what? <laughs> yeah, no, that is true. I never thought about it. <laughs> so, so here we have a little shrine where people who almost die on their motorcycles go to thank Mary for continued existence. <laughs> If you like bones, you don't go to the catacombs. There's really no bones in the catacombs. You go to the Capuchin uh, crypt. And there's a beautiful church right in downtown Rome and downstairs they've hanged the all the, their dead brothers up to dry and then they decorate with their bones. And that's just a very quirky, uh, fun little insight and you can visit that while you're in Rome if you like. Uh, any good guide knows it's hot and the history is overwhelming and we know to grab the little bit of shade. Here we got uh, in the shade of, a, of, a, of a, like a 4,000 year old obelisk. It's very interesting. Here we are in St. Peter's Square. There's the dome designed by Michelangelo. Uh, oh man, I'd love to just talk more about this, but we don't have time. But uh, it's important to remember St. Peter, who was executed as you know, part of halftime entertainment during one of the chariot races there. Um, they didn't have marching bands back then. Um, <laughs> And uh, this, this obelisk, this uh, Egyptian obelisk was brought there by the Romans and that decorated the chariot race course where Peter was martyred. So Peter would have seen this, this obelisk on the day he died. And they killed him and then after the games everybody goes home and his followers took Peter's body up to a little hill called the Vatican Hill and they buried him there. And for 300 years people worshiped secretly on the tomb of St. Peter. And then in the year 312, Emperor Constantine became a Christian. And suddenly, you could worship on Peter's tomb openly. In fact, Constantine had a huge church built right there. And then only in the, uh, around the year 1500 was that church uh, replaced by this even more grand church, the church we have today. These are the kind of understandings you'll take away with you when you're in the care of a good guide. And all of a sudden, all these things you've heard about all your life, it comes together. It comes together. And that's where I really like to employ our guides. To S. Petrus, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. If you see a guide with a big bushy beard and a key, you know that's gonna be Peter. Uh, in the winter, we have a lot of uh, Rome tours. We've tried many different cities uh, for one-week getaways, and I think one-week getaways make a lot of sense, but frankly, a lot of cities just don't sell enough to keep a program going. But the four cities that clearly work from a one-week winter getaway or any time of year getaway point of view, London, Paris, Istanbul, and Rome. And any time of year, Rome makes a lot of sense. And in the winter, I absolutely love going to Rome in the dead of winter. You've got the big manger scene right here on St. Peter's Square. You've got uh, all the Christmas festivities in Rome going until January 6th. Uh, Virginia, can you explain La Bufana? Yes, La Bufana, it's like the Italian Santa Claus kind of. I always thought when I was a kid that she was the wife of Santa Claus. I don't know why, but she's the... <laughs> <laughs> I know, but the Italian kids are really lucky because they get presents for Christmas and they also get presents on the 6th of January uh, by the Befana. Befana is also a word when uh, you see <laughs> somebody that's uh, not really nice and you very can say, not very attractive, so you can say Befana in 
in Italian. It's not an but it's not an offense, it's actually a nice word, yeah. I so, but call my mother-in-law like that all the time, so. <laughs> what, you call your mother-in-law La Bufana? Yeah, sometimes, but she, she does understand because she doesn't speak Italian. So she takes it as a compliment. Oh, so she says, grazie. Yes. La bufana, grazie. So every time she comes down, I say, bifana. She said, I love you, Aldo. But uh, she doesn't know the, the meaning, so don't tell her. <laughs> and uh, January 6th is, uh, uh, what is the, the name of that holiday? Epiphania. Uh, Epiphany, that's right. Epiphany, the day the wise men finally, finally brought the, the gifts to baby Jesus was January 6th, after the 12 days of Christmas. And that is the big finale for the kids in Rome, in Italy. And especially in Rome, they have that Epiphany celebration. So it's something to remember. You could have Christmas at home, you could fly to Italy and have another kind of Christmas on Epiphany. From the top of the Dome of St. Peter's, you look down and you see the little Vatican, the tiniest country in Europe. And you can look also at the great square, Piazza San Pedro, the obelisk that St. Peter saw the day he was martyred. And then the grand boulevard Mussolini made to blast through the medieval quarter so people could see a better view of the great church. Step, one of my great treats as a tour guide is to, I've been in the church enough now to, to know what to anticipate. And my reward is to watch the faces of my tourists when they step through that door from the narthex into the grand uh, main sanctuary of St. Peter's Basilica and just swept, oh, just overwhelmed with beauty. It's just awe-inspiring. Uh, it's jaw-dropping, literally. You step in there, it's the grandest and biggest church in Christendom. It is uh, the next biggest church. There's marks on the floor where they would fit if they were put inside. Uh, and uh, it's so big. I mean, birds fly in there not even knowing they're indoors, you know? Um, I've lost entire groups in St. Peter's and <laughs> not been able to find them. I mean, 25 people, where are they? Uh, and uh, of course, you've got St. Peter's, uh, or you've got uh, Michelangelo's Pieta, and you've got plenty of ways in to enjoy that. You can wait in line and go up to the top of the dome, if you like, for a great view. And from the top of the dome, you can look down and see this huge building, which is I, it must be one of the biggest museums in the world. This is the Pape, the Vatican Museum. For, for 1,500 years, people have been sending the Pope gifts, and the Pope's been out there grabbing up stuff in the old days when they were, when they were a power of their own. And today, all that is collected there at the Vatican Museum. I love when one of our guides takes our groups through the Vatican and everybody's having a great time. The Vatican can be exhausting, but our guides know how to make it enjoyable. They know what you need to see, what makes sense, what's important, and how much energy you've got. There's a lot to talk about, and you don't want to spend all your energy before you get to the, the finale, the Sistine uh, Chapel, with the beautiful ceiling by Michelangelo, and then the Last Supper behind the altar, or the Last Judgment behind the altar. There's two sort of worlds of visitors to Rome. There are tourists like you and me, and there are pilgrims. And I think as tourists, it's nice to know about the whole pilgrim end of the Rome thing, and our guides will point that out. A lot of people are coming from the Ukraine, or Poland, or Brazil, and they are there, you know, not to see uh, Piazza Navona or something, but they're there to climb the stairs of Pontius Pilate's mansion on their knees, saying the rosary at every step. This is so exciting to have a sort of a, an appreciation of that dimension of Rome, and you will learn that. Also, an important dimension of Rome is going into Trastevere and finding this Casalinga. Aldo, tell me about Casalinga. See, si, Casalinga uh, is the Italian word for a housewife. And uh, we have a trattoria, it's a small family run restaurant where you will meet our Italian mama. She's our Italian mama. She will cook for the family, she will cook for you. So, and to be honest with you, especially from the center of Italy to the south, that's what still nowadays Italian ladies are doing. They are all Casalinghe. And you can find housewives. a little restaurant that really oh, is this yeah. kind of home cooking. I mean, look at this woman. I call her Antipasta. Si. <laughs> <laughs> and she just wants to feed you. You go in there, there's no menu. You give her 20 euros and she just brings on the food. It's an a And when you when food. you go in those kind of restaurants, you have to eat. You are forced to eat. Otherwise, the mama, she will be offended. And it will be your problem. So so we'll have that kind of food experience lined up for you. I love the passeggiata in Italy. You know, everybody goes out in strolls. It's the paseo in Spain, the passeggiata in uh, Italy, and in Rome in particular, it's called the struccio. That's in the, there's an elegant passeggiata in other towns, but in Rome it's more of a, you remember a, um, 
the fawns and uh, Greece and all that kind of stuff where everybody's out cruising and, and showing off and I'm, I'm stronger than your guy and all that sort of thing. Well, in Rome, you've still got these greasers. Uh, Coato? Is that what they're The Coato. Yes. Virginia, can you tell us who in the Coato is? In fact, were wondering, how do you know this word? The, how do I know this? <laughs> where, what is the Coato, Virginia? Oh, I don't know how would I translate that. How do we translate that? A coato is somebody that... Uh, Aldo, he looks like a coato. Yes. Let, let Aldo... We can walk <laughs> like a coato. She's going to explain. I'm going to give you a quick demo. <laughs> okay. It's like a person that uh, um, pretends that he knows everything. And then he feels important even if this person is not important. So imagine that the main street becomes like a fashion show like that. So everyone is there looking at him and uh, this is the evening for him. And so this is Coatto and the Passeggiata. Uh, and in, in Rome, there's a lot of poor neighborhoods that don't have public spaces. And these, these are where you're gonna find your greasers and your Coatto really, these uh, you know young Romeos from the suburbs. And they're gonna go where there is a public space. It's downtown and then it's this, it's this show off. And all over Italy, when you, when you do the Passeggiata, you know, you're admiring people. So if you see a beautiful looking woman, you say Bella. And if you see a beautiful looking guy, you say Bello. Right? But in Rome, they have a different word, and I don't know exactly what it is, but it's basically, I could take you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> and it's called, it's called the rubbing, and everybody is, is struccio, doesn't that mean rubbing? So they're rubbing against each other as they're out c cruising. It's like, cru we have cruising in cars. All over Italy, it's cruising without cars, and in Rome, it's a contact sport, okay? <laughs> so Rome closes off. The, uh, Rome closes off the main drag, the Via, uh, what is it, the Via del Corso, what is it called, the Del Corso? Via del Corso. Sì. Via del Corso. Close it to traffic, policeman there, horse, can't go in with your car, and then everybody's out making the scene. Be there, you're going to enjoy a slice of Rome that a lot of tourists miss. Spend too much for a cup of coffee, anchor yourself on that beautiful spot, and watch the river of Italy roll on by. Go to the famous night spots any time of day, enjoy that. I just love the Campo di Fiori. I love to toss a coin into the fountain at uh, Trevi Fountain. Your guide will lace together the night spot so you can now be out there making the scene, and I think that really makes your trip uh, kind of magic, and you know you're going to go back to Italy again. So, hey, we've got just a few minutes. I want to make sure, um, actually, uh, if Virginia or Aldo, if you have anything you'd like to add to what I was talking about, uh, anything you might correct, you guys do the tours, I don't. Virginia? Not, not correct, but I just wanted to say that Italy, it's uh, everything that you imagine, and it's so much more. Uh, it's, it's really a lot of fun. It's so, uh, the, the food is such an important part of our culture. See, I'm moving my hands a lot, I just realized. <laughs> but uh, the food is such an important part of our culture, and it's so different wherever you go. So whatever food you will have in Venice, you will not have in Rome. And the, the Romans would be so proud of their cuisine, and uh, Florentine would be so proud of their bistecca, la Fiorentina, and so forth there and so on. So it's a, it's a little microcosm with a lot of, uh, um, I don't know, a lot of, uh, uh, every region is so different, uh, and it varies so much. So Great. Aldo, anything to That's add? That's the reason why it's going to be very difficult to compare Italy wherever you will be going. I would say in Italy you can uh, discover, you can enjoy la dolce vita. It's still like that. It hasn't changed. But don't expect perfection. For it sure. It not exist. <laughs> Especially if you go to the north and then you go to the south. In the south, Nothing works. <laughs> Nothing. We say in Italian, niente. But we love it. I met so many travelers traveling with us, and they said, Aldo, it was so imperfect. Not the tour, but the, the system in southern Italy. But we love it. We got a good memory. So come to Italy. La dolce vita is waiting for you. Grazie. Uh, Aldo, what is the word we were talking about? Organized chaos? Si. Eh, this is the word chaos. Chaos organizzato. Chaos organizzato. <laughs> organized chaos. <laughs> you don't have organized chaos in Germany. You've just got organized. But in, in Italy, it's organized chaos. And it works. It really works. You know. So if, if you're flexible and if you have the right attitude and if you have leadership that can help uh, uh, make it actually a, a festival. Okay, we've got five minutes for questions. Uh, are there any questions that we would like to clarify? Yeah. Uh, you 
We don't, is, the question is, do we have discounts if somebody wants to stay in the same hotel afterwards? I don't believe we have discounts, but we can make sure that you are treated fairly if you want to, and you can, uh, we'll get information about where you might want to stay. But we don't get discounts for our groups, and we just have to pay the, the going rate, and, and you would too if you stayed longer. But it is nice to be able to book a few extra days after your tour, and you might even want to consider staying in another neighborhood too. So you got that option, and, and our, our staff is very happy to help you out with that. Yeah. Frank yeah. Yeah, I know the place. She's talking. Did you, was it a good experience? Yeah. Yeah. She went to it. I used to be in my book and it was a dinner club uh, where a man, you know, in Italy, there's a lot of stuff that goes sort of under the table. And if you're a restaurant without a license, you can't have a name. You don't have any sign, it's just you, you push the buzzer and they let you in, and he cooks for you. And this flamboyant guy it was out in uh, Piazza San Pedro e Paolo, uh, up at the hospital, and oh, he was the most flamboyant, wonderful guy, and every night there'd be music and singing and many, many courses, and that was one of the magical, those are the kind of tri places I try to discover, and that particular place, I think he's in jail now, so. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, he's not in jail, but he's out of business and, and doing some other scam. But it was a magical place. I remember that well. I really miss him. Any other questions <laughs> about my Italian friends? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, I was hoping uh, that you'd also say a little bit about um, Cinque Terre. Cinque Terre, yeah. Well, the Cinque Terre... Um, there you go, that's one of five towns. Can you imagine five towns like that that you can walk to without any traffic? Uh, you'd go there by train and it's wonderful. They, they had a flood a year ago and it destroyed the, all the businesses and most of the businesses in two of the towns, but it's in, they've worked really hard. I've been there twice since and it's back uh, ready for prime time. And thank goodness the Cinque Terre is back on its feet after that terrible flood, uh, but it's, it's um, it's just a magical place. We stop there in, in most of our Italy tours. We don't stop there in our 10-day Venice, Florence, Rome tour. But the Cinque Terre is my vote for the very best stop anywhere on the Riviera. Cinque Terre. You can learn more about that in any of our material in our books. In the back there. You've talked a lot about food. Do you have any provisions on your tours for vegetarians? If you're a vegetarian in Italy, it's quite easy because there's lots of beautiful vegetarian dishes and what you would want to do is, uh, the question is if you're a vegetarian, are you, can you have all this fun, I think, you know? Uh, you can have plenty of fun as a vegetarian. Actually, uh, Virginia, why don't you talk about Absolutely. how you would help? Absolutely, it's not a problem at all. I've had veg many vegetarians on, on uh, the tour and uh, we just talk to the restaurant and we make sure you have uh, a nice meal just like everybody else, so that's a vegetarian. Or you can be an Italian vegetarian. Italian vegetarian, it, Vegetables and prosciutto. Prosciutto is the exception. <laughs> I love it. I, I, I learned something there. An Italian vegetarian. Yes, back there. How would you prepare the weather in October for those three cities compared to, I guess, well, how's the weather in those cities? To me, I always say Italy is like Southern California. Uh, so, you know, it's going to be really hot in May, in April, or I'm sorry, in Ju July and August. Ideal in April, May, September, October. And I think quite nice in the winter. It can be very cold. I've been bitter cold in Italy, wearing like ski clothes. But I just, it's very fresh. And if you're wearing, in Europe, they always say there's no bad weather, just inappropriate clothing, you know. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think... Um, Italy is sort of Southern Californian weather. It's Venice and Florence and Rome are a little bit different, but in, in, a, in, in broad terms, that's what it is. You're talking about November? October. October. I think October is ideal. Uh, November is a little late. It can be cold, but I, I think October is very nice. My frustration, if I'm in April or October, there's no beach action uh, for my TV filming. So I go to the Amalfi Coast in April and it's dead. But from a sightseeing point of view, a restaurant point of view, a connecting with the museums and the people and the culture, October is just great. Yeah. For safety reasons? Is there any reason, any place in Rome I would not take a group? Um, Virginia? No, I think, no. <laughs> Pistachio used to be kind of uh, edgy, didn't it? Is it or where, I think uh, the flea market, you're likely to get pickpocketed. Of course, but I mean, I see in every other city in the world. Yeah. Rome, yeah. it's actually a very, very safe city. Very, Al very Aldo, safe do you city. have any thoughts on that? Is it? Um, 
I agree with Virginia. Every right. city, I guess, in the world that there is pickpocket, so that's fine. Yeah, you need to use common Talk sense, but I think it's a lot safer than you know, L.A., Chicago, or New York if you were just wandering around at night. Yes. You mentioned the weather in December in Italy. What about Austria, Germany? Are there reasons you would not travel to those areas? The happen? question about traveling north of the Alps in the winter, days are short. Sites are pretty much locked up and that are outdoor sites, and it just can be bleak and, and gray and, and drizzly. I mean, you can still go there. I mean, you can have your hot spiced wine and Christmas markets and that sort of thing. There's nothing wrong with it. But I like long days, and I like action in the villages and in the open air folk museums and so on. Uh, if I'm in the winter in Europe, I either like to be in the south or in big cities. If you go to big, lace a bunch of big cities together in the north of Europe, it's great. It's like going to big cities in the United States in the winter. But if you're tooling around in the countryside and taking, you know, wanting to get into that, I think it, it really is less interesting in the winter. And I don't like the short days when I'm traveling. And the, it's a high northern at latitude. So you're Alaskan latitudes in some cases, and, and it means it gets dark early. In the back. How is the city of Olia? How is the city of Olia? How do you spell that? In Sardinia. I don't know Sardinia. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's uh, you know I leave the islands mostly for Italian vacationers. I'm, I'm sure there's reason to go there, but you know we try to do the the core of Italy for people who have less than a month in Italy, and, and Sardinia doesn't make the cut. Yeah. I saw horrible flooding in Venice this winter. Did it get in and damage anything like furniture? Was there Not a great the high water? That's what you mean. The, the flooding, yeah. the high water in Venice this winter. Any any uh, damage? It it was very high. It was uh, uh, much higher than the 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 rule, but uh, but I, but they managed really well. They were prepared. They know they are more frequent in the winter, and the weather may get higher. But they're working on a major project called the Moses, uh, which eventually it's uh, it's actually 60 percent uh, 60 percent finished. Uh, it's a major project that um, uh, like panels in the water that will eventually pop up when there is a uh, uh, high water, and they will block the water and saves the city. So, Europeans yeah. are spending a lot of money anticipating higher sea levels. The, the Belgians and the Dutch are spending a lot of money raising their dikes. Uh, of course, Venice has to be concerned about that, as does New York and New Orleans and a lot of places. So let's see what happens. Uh, yeah. How did the foundations hold up in Venice? Or did they have to replace it very often? The foundations in Venice, the wood is fine as long as it's underwater. It, the problem is when it gets exposed to air. On the main square, every few hundred years, they pull up the, the top pavement and they add more sand and they put down the pavement again and it's a few inches higher. Consequently, the, the, the columns seem shorter and shorter and shorter because the, the ground level is creeping up. And it, then all of a sudden they're out of, they're not in the beautiful, elegant proportions that they used to have. But as far as how the city is weathering all of that, uh, that's something that's kind of a long story. And I'm sure your guide talks about that when you're, when you're in Venice beyond that. Uh, one last question, anybody? Uh, yeah. Well, if, uh, what do you think about nightlife? I'm going to say your guide will know. <laughs> your guide will know everything, whatever you want to know. But That's true. Our Italian guides know what's going on after dinner. Uh, that's a great joy of Italy, and there's lots happening. My son is in Rome right now, and he's just having a blast. He loves Italy. Oh. Yeah, Andy does college-age tours, and uh, you could Google Andy Steves and see his work, and he puts together wonderful tours uh, over there for college kids for, for weekends, when they get a three-day weekend. Every weekend's a three-day weekend.